Mbak Anissa bisa dimulai. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, good morning all. Welcome to the class of disaster Selamat. science. And as announced before, today we will have special guest lecture with Mr. Michael Fischer from University of Hawaii at Manoa. And because today we will have special guest and also several participants from international class program. So today's class will be held in bilingual. So we will speak both in Indonesian and also in English. And before we start our class today, let's start by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And, and now I would like to invite the head of undergraduate program in civil engineering to give her a welcoming speech. Please welcome Ms. Yunalia Muntafi, PhD Eng. Okay, uh, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mbak Anissa. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning students and good morning uh, everyone here. Um, the first one I would like to uh, say hello to Mr. Micha. Hello Dr. Micha, how are you today? <laughs> I hope you are enjoying your day today. So because you will have a expert lecture here. And you. we are very welcome you. Even though we are so far away, maybe more than 5,000 miles away, but we can meet in this screen. So um, I hope I can directly meet you. <laughs> uh, and then the second one is, uh, I would like to say thank you for the lecture here. Uh, and also Mr. Didit, uh, Pak Pradipta, uh, good morning. And then Bu good Sri morning. Aminatun, Bu Anissa, and Pak Fendi. So, Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. So today we will have a special events. Uh, we will have a special lecture today, and I hope all of you enjoy uh, the lecture. And I think uh, today's will be very special because uh, I hear that uh, Mr. Micah can also speak in Bahasa, right? <laughs> so maybe um, due to the conditions, because not only. Uh, in uh, the participant here, not only from international students, but also from the uh, student from regular program. So uh, maybe uh, this lecture will be uh, delivered in bilingual. So uh, I hope uh, Dr. Micha can deliver the, the lecture uh, by using uh, mixed Bahasa and also uh, English in English. So uh, I think that's all for me. Uh, I hope you enjoy this lecture and yeah, just, I want to say good morning and uh, I would like to give uh, the next speech to maybe for Mr. Didit as the uh, IP program uh, head of every program in the civil engineering department. Mr. Didit, the uh, time is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you for the time. And I also want to uh, like to deliver the message Thank you for Dr. Micha, because uh, this is uh, the majority of the students come from the first semester that they uh, learn regarding the disaster science. And I think that they need to know the development of the disaster knowledge in the global perspective, because as we know, there are many disasters uh particularly regarding uh, hydro hydrometeorology in Europe and in uh, America there are many drops and today I think that they are prepared for the flood also because there are uh, climate uh, a significant climate condition in the uh, northern of uh, the earth uh, I think that I hope that uh, Mr. Kniza also can encourage the student to uh, to enhance their uh, curiosity regarding the disaster. That and all this, we cannot neglect disaster uh, factor in uh, civil engineering uh, in uh, designing 
the uh, construction actually we must give a huge uh, intensity huge uh, huge uh, uh, I mean that uh, huge intensity in the uh, disaster uh, particularly in Indonesia such as the earthquake and also the uh, flood and maybe we cannot say that uh, maybe there are also draw where uh, Indonesia is uh, impacted by La Nina and, and you know sometimes the wind position shift and sometimes the precision also shift and I think it will impact in our life so I hope that Mr. Richard can uh, encourage our student regarding the uh, disaster in the future and uh, in the global perspective. Thank you, Dr. Mija. Okay, thank you for the speech, uh, Ms. Yonalia and Mr. Pradipta. Okay, I think we will directly move to the uh, main ag agenda for today. And today we will have um, special lecture from Dr. Mija Fischer for about an hour and 15 minutes. And then we will continue to the discussion for about uh, 40 minutes. Okay, everyone, please welcome our special guest, Dr. Mija Fischer, to give his lecture. Please, uh, Dr. Mija Fischer. Great, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. It's really great to be here. Um, I, I've been doing these lectures for a really long time now, and I really enjoy connecting with students in Indonesia. Um, so thank you to Ibusri Aminatun for always thinking of me. Um, and I do hope that this is a dialogue today. <laughs> So I encourage lots of participation. Um, I know that you all are taking classes in disaster management. And so some of these concepts may be redundant, but I also uh, approach disasters in ways that are a little bit different from um, some of the disaster management initiatives um, at UEE. Um, I'm an environmental social scientist. Uh, let me share my screen so that you can see some information. And what I want to focus today's presentation on is about uh, resilience. Does anybody has anybody heard of this concept before? Resilience. And please use the chat. If I ask questions. I would like to see lots of participation in the chat. And you can use either language um, to uh, answer the questions that I ask. So maybe catalyst isn't a word. I, I think it's an engineering word. It's something that sparks something, right? So um, Mr. Pradipta and the others um, in the introduction talked a lot about kind of Indonesia being uh, an epicenter of disaster, many, many different types of disasters in a place like Indonesia. And this is where the concept of resilience becomes so powerful, right? And what I want to focus on in this presentation is this idea of catalyst. So how do we begin to initiate a process that supports change, right? If and another key concept that I'll talk about is vulnerability. So the idea is how do we move from vulnerability to resilience and what types of things can we do to become more resilient? And I'm going to give you new definitions about vulnerability today um, from a more social science perspective, but I do believe that working together between the social sciences and the hard sciences like engineering is really, really important in addressing the future of disasters. So a little bit very briefly about myself. Um, I'm a research fellow at the East West Center and um, the East West Center is, a, is an organization that works to build cooperation between um, the United States and Asia, the Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific. <clears throat> 
And uh, we have a great scholarship program. Some people from uh, Indonesia, from UEE, have attended our program at the East West Center and did a degree at the University of Hawaii. I also teach at the University of Hawaii. I teach in three different departments. I teach in urban and regional planning. I teach in geography and the environment. And I also teach in peace and conflict resolution. So maybe my perspective, my background is a little bit different from what you're accustomed to uh, in your normal classes, especially when you're thinking about disaster management. Um, as an academic, um, I also am uh, an editor at a journal called Forest and Society, and it's part of my affiliation with Universitas Hassanuddin, and so I am a lecturer there, and I help uh, a network of scholars from Southeast Asia through UNHAS to produce a, a journal, and we've published 128 articles. It's a Q, it's a Q1, U2, opus level journal at this time. And so if your work touches on issues of natural hazards or disaster and um, touches on issues of the environment, please consider um, submitting your work to our journal. Okay. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on my background. Let's get to the content. So the overall outline of what I will share about today is the first is to give a very, very brief overview on the study of disaster. How do we study disasters? I'll introduce some key concepts and approaches to disaster management. I'll also talk about um, this really, really important concept, disaster risk reduction. So initiatives and approaches to reduce risk, as well as its complement, which is resilience. How do we become more resilient towards uh, disaster? I'll give you some examples of resilience at different scales or at different levels. And hopefully uh, we can have a question and answer or a discussion after that. Okay, I hope I'm not going too fast. I know that um, uh, this is an international class, but if you want to ask questions or you have ideas that you want to share, just please um, put them in the chat. I'm monitoring the chat and I can address them directly. So I think uh, Universitas Islam Indonesia has done some amazing work on disasters. When I went to UIE for the first time 10 years ago, I met with Professor Widodo, Prof. Tegu, and uh, a lot of these professors that had done their research around a very significant event. So there was a disaster uh, in Georgia, an earthquake, a volcanic eruption. And one of the key issues they were looking at was building codes, not for the large industrial scare buildings, but for the smaller buildings. And it was quite remarkable what they were trying to do, which is to introduce building codes that would save many people's lives. And this is very much an engineering type of, of, of an approach, right? To identify the problem and to introduce ways at developing solutions. However, when we, when we started going to the field, we also began to identify that um, a lot of disaster risk and disaster management is not a technical fix, but rather a social solution. Right? How do you get communities to adapt? How do you get communities to introduce and incorporate? Um, how do you create the programs that allow them to get the types of materials that they don't? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in the chat. Again, I'm going to try to continue to ask you to respond to my questions in the chat. So right now, and I very much appreciate um, Angata Utami, you're an international student. Thank you for responding. And I'm hoping others will uh, respond as well. So just a very quick poll, please just write in the chat. What interests you about disasters? Um, so is it earthquakes? Is it a personal experience? I don't know how to get into your Google Classroom right now, but I would be happy to share my PowerPoint with you later. 
So yeah, uh, if you could put in the chat, what interests you about disaster? Maybe one line or maybe one word. Is it volcanoes? Is it floods? Is it uh, public health? Is it social vulnerability? It can be many, many different issues. And the second question that goes along with that is how should we study disasters, right? So when you think about the complexity of a dynamic like a volcanic eruption, where do you begin? Of course, you need to understand the physical properties of a volcano. What is the precursors? What are the signs? What are the early warning systems? But it also means that you need to learn how to do the communication. How do you get the information out to the public? How do you ensure that the right public services? Because when we talk about disasters, oftentimes we talk about situations um, of, of serious concern, right? If we don't do the right thing, or if the right measures aren't in place, people could lose their lives. And it could be a very serious situation that um, has very long-term effects, right? When we talk about disasters, a lot of the issues aren't just the moment of disaster, right? We look at Mount Pinatubo, for example, where the um, explosion of the volcanic eruption, yes, there were casualties with that, but many of the casualties happened much later with, associated with the lahars and the rainfall and the flows and the landslides and all of these other, other issues. So I'm just trying to give you an initial picture of the overall complexity of disasters. And I want to ask these questions because I hope that it begins to help you to think about what are the best ways of studying disasters. Okay, so I mentioned that I'm a social scientist, environmental social scientist. Uh, my background is in geography and urban regional planning and environmental studies. So what I, what I want to ask you first is how do you apply a social science lens to disasters? So what we often do is think in terms of a systems perspective. What are the systems in place, right? What is a hazard? So yes, we can talk about a natural event, for example. Um, but one of the ways that my tradition of research, um, which is political ecology, is to look not only at the direct uh, factors, the direct impacts, but also the indirect impacts, right? So for example, a lot of research on political ecology looking at flooding oftentimes tries to critique development in upstream areas. So the narrative that farmers are deforesting the upstream areas and faulting those farmers well, we take a systems approach to try to understand what are the reasons for environmental change and why um, would those changes be happening? Is it because there's not enough development resources for farm development? Is it because there's been enclosures or people have been moved out of their land to go elsewhere? And um, is it related to more and more people moving to cities? So these systems of what connects one issue to the next is how a political ecologist would understand the issues of natural disaster. And the question then becomes, when we see it in terms of a system of, of systems approach is the question of, are natural disasters natural? The idea of a disaster is that it is an unnatural event, right? So even if there is an environmental hazard, the fact that some um, experience a disaster versus others um, and the protections of, of, of a community or of people, um, that is an unnatural situation, right? Um, so for example, if there's an earthquake in a place where there's nobody living there, it's not a disaster, it's just a natural event. But we also want to ask, for example, the difference of an earthquake in California versus an earthquake in Haiti, right? The same magnitude of an earthquake in California will have almost no casualties versus the same event in a place like Haiti because of um, development and poverty and building codes and uh, access to resources, the impacts of those natural events are very different from one place to the next. 
Um, another way to think in terms of social science disasters is to break down the different um, normative elements. So what does that mean? That means aspects of decision making. Who makes the decision in a process? Who gets to decide? What types of actions are taken or inactions? You know, we've seen a lot of really, really unique uh, and, and devastating and, and tragedies, right? Disasters recently. For example, like the soccer game in, in, in Indonesia or the bridge collapse in India or the stampedes in South Korea, right? These, some of these issues are uh, boiled down to issues of action and inaction, right? They could have been avoided by very, very specific measures that were either taken or not taken. Um, we can also see them in terms of their different phases, right? There's questions of evacuation, you know, a lot of research on 9-11 in New York, for example, that showed how spontaneous evacuation took place or even other situations in Korea on very complex uh, processes of eviction that went wrong. Another case that's often talked about were the children that were stuck in the mines in uh, in, in Thailand, for example. So issues of evacuation. Other really important elements are preparation, right? It, this can be done at the individual level. How do you prepare your own household if a disaster or if certain conditions were to take place? Um, elements of risk-taking, the extent to which a risk is taken in a certain event, uh, what types of response, as well as some of the longer term. you know. A lot of the issues of disasters isn't necessarily the event, but also how to recover from the event. And this is really complex. It's not just about, for example, rebuilding houses, providing water to households, but the disasters that I worked on, the tsunami in American Samoa, one of the key questions were 10, 15 years later were around psychological trauma, right? People do not recover if they lost a loved one for many, many years, if ever. So those kinds of aspects of disasters are really important, particularly from a social science perspective. I talked a lot about systems, but systems are also related to planning. So this is, we know, I mentioned the word scale. This is really important to planners and geographers. So planning can take place at the household, at the community, at the Erte Erwe level, at the Kachamatan level, Desa level, Kalurahan level, all the way up to the national level, right? There's processes that planning um, processes undergo to ensure that people are, uh, able to address situations of disaster. And more broadly, I wanna talk a little bit about vulnerability and concepts of adaptation. Um, vulnerability sees disaster, not just vulnerability to that particular disaster. It is looking at vulnerability in a more holistic sense, right? Different places are vulnerable, whether there is or is not a disaster. So when you add a disaster condition, a hazard situation, then those vulnerabilities are pronounced, right? They're exacerbated. Things are made more, uh, more threatening and risky in, in that kind of language. And alongside that topic is adaptation and resilience. And adaptation is a really important concept when we talk about climate change. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So sorry to go on a little bit long here. I hope some of these concepts make sense, but what I'm trying to get you to be aware of is how social scientists would think about the issues of disaster in very different terms. So I wanna say one more time that, you know, we've been working for many years, um, not as much since the pandemic, but the UEE and the University of Hawaii uh, and the East West Center have been working for a really long time to look at how to combine engineering with social sciences to address uh, disasters. And I really think that this multidisciplinary approach, the tools that we both have uh, between our traditions of research can provide really, really powerful solutions for addressing uh, disasters. <clears throat> 
And I do encourage you all to apply to the dual degree program. I think it's still in place, but Sri, Ibu Sri Iman Aminatun can tell you more about that later. So let's talk a little bit about what is a disaster. There's really interesting articles that look at the etymology. Etymology means the origin of a word. So it comes from the Italian disastro, meaning unfavorable to one stars. So dis means bad and astro means stars, right? So it's really, um, you know, a situation that uh, it's like, Meramal kejadian yang buruk, right? Like it's something unlucky uh, that happens to you, right? So there's this uh, element of uncertainty that's built into the very terminology of the disaster. And furthermore, disasters are often defined as an event or a situation which causes great damage or destruction and human suffering, right? And worse than a disaster would be a catastrophe, like a malapetaka or something like that, right? That's that's another whole scale of, of, of disaster. And I'll talk about different scales and types of disasters uh, soon. But like I said earlier, if people are not affected, it's not a disaster. You can have the biggest hurricane in the world. Um, but if there's no people that are in the way, then it's not a disaster, right? But a very small uh, cyclone or I mean, topan can have very, very destructive effects, even if it happens in a place that is very risk uh, at risk towards conditions of a disaster. So, um, yeah, let's. What is a disaster? Okay, learning from disasters. So I'm going to give you two very common ways to think about disaster. So this uh, diagram on the left is what we normally understand as the disaster cycle. Um, I'm sure you've seen this all before, but I want to give you different layers to thinking about it. Um, as I mentioned, because we from the, the planners and the normative social sciences um, and the more critical social sciences think about these in different ways. So. Here you have a disaster event. So the ways that planners approach this issue is first to think about preparedness, right? And then you have the response phase, right? If something happens, the more prepared you are, the better, the more resilient you will be for a disaster. And how you execute the response, how you implement response, right? Uh, those phases are really, really important. And then you move into the reconstruction or the recovery phases. And then there's this whole learning element related to mitigation, right? Once you know what your hazards are, you can begin to plan and to prepare and to mitigate. And so the second layer of this disaster cycle on the outside here really, really connects to experience, right? Knowledge. And here, you know, people talk about ka'arifan lokal, right? Local wisdom, these generations of knowledge about a place or just the experiences, right? The people who have gone through these situations over and over again. Like, for example, one of the best places to learn about preparedness for flood management was in Kampung Malayu in Jakarta because they dealt with it over and over again. Their systems, their communication um, was so good, more sophisticated than very, very technical systems because they were very accustomed to dealing with these situations. And there's a lot to learn from those conditions. So beyond the experience, knowledge, understanding, learning, and the adaptive behaviors, this is where we have the adaptation and the resilience, right? How do you tweak? How do you move systems around to be able to better prepare, to better respond, to better recover, and to inherently implement mitigative um, systems to become, uh, to, to, to be able to approach how to make disasters um, uh, not occur, uh, even when there's very, very serious natural hazard events that take place. So that's one way of thinking of disasters. Another way of thinking about it is over on this diagram here. And what I really like about this one is it's very, while, while this one's very conceptual, this is very, very specific, right? We can think about a wildfire, right? 
karhutla, for example, kebakaran hutan dan lahan. Like people know what that is, and you can put it on this scale here to understand what the temporal dimensions and the geographic scale dimensions. What that means, temporal and geographic, just means where does it take place and how long does it take place? And that's a really, really useful one because usually the shorter events, these red events, the tornadoes, landslides, flash floods, storm surge, these are generally very life-threatening, right? Very dangerous. They happen very quickly. You don't have much... Uh, preparation time for them, uh, and usually there's uh, they're they're highly correlated with casualties. A lot of people die um, when those conditions take place. And then there's this orange area here, which is kind of the meso level, the middle level. So yes, they're potentially life threatening. These are things you can better prepare for. You have more information about uh, when they take place, but they also tend to take place over a larger uh, area, right? So a lot of this stuff has to do with things that don't happen in Indonesia, right? Salju, you don't have salju in most of Indonesia uh, snow, but things like river floods, right? They're slowly happening. You have several days to know when they're happening, but they can flood a large area and you know they create a a, 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 a nuisance but you, you know people can prepare and generally survive events like that and then there's this these green ones over here this is related to things like climate variability so el nino and la nina these are you know five to six year um recurring phenomena that um, happen over a large area and the time scales are, 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 are longer as well. And we get to kind of global or regional scale issues like climate change and how climate change will impact uh, at the global scale. So I hope this is helpful for you to think through not just processes, but also the temporal geographic and the specific hazard initiatives that you th think about in terms of conducting vulnerability assessments, as well as building resilience. So um, based on a lot of, you know, disaster science, right, is a very new science. It's not like sociology or engineering or, you know, those studies have been around for a long time. Disaster sciences are very multidisciplinary. There's been a lot of interest in recent years trying to really develop research around disasters specifically. How do we study disasters? How do we you know, support initiatives that plan better for disasters? Um, so, but when you look at, for example, these types of planning initiatives for Indonesia, like the entire map is red. Right. So is everywhere equally uh, at risk, Barisiko Tinggi in Indonesia? And the answer is no. Right. So these kind of assessments can help to identify large scale processes, but they're not as helpful at supporting initiatives at the very localized scale where adaptation measures, where disaster is most important um, to be addressed. So, um, you know, these types of, I will show more examples of this, of how mapping has becoming very interscalar. It can go up and down into different places. It can give you information and new types of algorithms and assessments to understand the hazards of a place. But there's also no substitute to really understanding the social, the cultural, the communication systems that are in place um, that people have learned over time to build resilience. Here's another example of the differentiated elements of natural hazards. When we look at Indonesia, right? You have the mega thrust zone, these areas where are very high risk um, for potential uh, right? Uh, earthquake seismic activity, but also areas that um, are where the ring of fire, lots of volcanic activity, uh, take place in those types of disaster. So there's a specific geographic element to the, the disaster profile in Indonesia, and these conditions also make uh, Indonesia very, very vulnerable um, to potential disasters. So when we look, and this is an old slide, this is, this is kind of looking at disasters from 1815 to 2011, and looking at over time at the number of casualties, 
and this is really interesting, right? When we look at casualties, when we look at the number of victims and the occurrences, what we see here is that flooding happens all the time, right? And flooding is increasing all the time in Indonesia. But when you look at the blue line, the casualties, the number of korban jiwa, right? The people who have died from a disaster, right? Just one or two events like the tsunami can account for almost all of the, 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 the highest percentage of casualties, deaths um, in disasters in Indonesia. And understanding that dynamic is really important, right? Protecting communities from flooding is very much related to, for example, economic growth. If people are being flooded all the time, they may survive, but that also makes it difficult to kind of provide the convivial, the, the lifestyles that a lot of the development targets in Indonesia imagine for this place. On the other hand, um, we need to be very, very much aware of the potential for a large scale tsunami that can have devastating events of hundreds of thousands of people being swept away uh, forever. So, Understanding this dimension of disaster is also really important. Now, I did a study in a, a, a couple of years ago to look at how does Indonesia think about disaster management and how do people learn about disaster management in Indonesia? So with BNPB, I identified all the different types of coursework that they develop. And here you can see the different types of courses. Um, and the level of training. So the most common training that takes place is this basic disaster management. So uh, there's, you know, about more than 50% of people have been trained in, this, in the basic disaster management course. But most of these other courses, a lot of the people that work in disaster management, there's still a lot of training and learning that needs to happen to get this blue to come over here so that, so that there's better preparation operation on the disaster management systems in Indonesia. So there's a lot of work to be done. And I think it's great that the NPB is very aware of these issues and really, really focused on doing more training. And it really just shows how important training is in building resilience, right? The more prepared, the more training you do, the more prepared different institutions are to be able to protect the communities. And what I think is really interesting about this graphic is the types of titles here, right? The types of courses that are developed also correlates to what the Indonesian government, for example, thinks is the most important uh, topic to be, to be done. So disaster risk reduction. I, I see that people aren't really putting any information in the chat, but if you uh, want to answer some questions, please put this in the chat. Has anybody ever heard of disaster risk reduction? In Indonesian, this would be pemurangan risiko bencana, right? PRB, which is often uh, an acronym that's used in disaster management studies. And this is a pretty new concept, um, right? It's, it's, uh, it's an innovation in disaster studies. It only started happening in about uh, 2000, the mid 2000s um, after Aceh, after Hurricane Katrina. A lot, a, a lot of disaster was just focused on things like SAR, right? Search and rescue, tanggap uh, darurat. It was very military centric, police centric. How do we go in and save lives? Um, but a lot of the studies were starting to show that um, it's really important to transition. And those things are important, saving lives, life-saving skills, and um, you know, simulations to save lives are really important. But what really saves lives is prevention and recovery, right? There's economic analysis that's really shown that you know, the level of training, the types of preparedness, conducting vulnerability assessments, identifying the locations and the people and the places that are most vulnerable is the best way to reduce the impacts of the disaster. So that's where this concept of Pe'erbe really emerged out of. And it it's really related to uh, questions of assessing hazards and risk, right? How do you know which place is at risk? Under what conditions are they at risk and why? And these are two locations. This location on the top is from Bandung in an area that used to not flood as much, but because of uh, different changes throughout the system of the waterways there, it's began to flood in this community uh, regularly in very dangerous sorts of ways. 
Um, and this one in the bottom is a place in Manoguari that was a location that a tsunami hit. And you can imagine coastal fishing communities like this, if a tsunami comes through, the destruction would be devastating. But a tsunami might only come through once every generation, right? So um, the questions about hazards and risks are definitely definitely based on the likelihood of the event happening. And so that's why this, this move towards disaster risk reduction really highlights the importance of assessing vulnerability. So what is vulnerability? I think vulnerability is one of the most flexible and useful concepts for studying disasters and for really assessing anything related to risk and uh, related to development challenges almost anywhere, right? And it gives us a really nice way to think about um, different challenges. So vulnerability and conducting vulnerability assessments and any disaster plan would begin first with conducting a vulnerability assessment, begins with looking at exposure, right? This exposure in Indonesian, sometimes it's translated into keterpaparan, right? The extent to which you are exposed to a hazard. And usually this is shown using maps. Um, sensitivity, on the other hand, is the extent to which being exposed to event can have uh, significant impacts, right? So uh, for example, you know, you can live near the coast, right? You can be exposed to sea level rise, but if you have a high wall, you're not very sensitive to that sea level rise. But if that exposure begins to go over the seawall, the sensitivity would be quite profound, right? In terms of the additional, the indirect, uh, the other effects that happen with a specific hazard. And when you combine exposure and sensitivity, some people define this as impacts. Some people just skip this step because it's already in the exposure and the sensitivity. But having a category of impacts really helps you to think and combine um, the different elements of, of a hazard uh, in, an, in, in a more concise and direct uh, uh, way. I, it, it doesn't really matter. I think you can just you know get rid of that one. Exposure time sensitivity over adaptive capacity. If you want to see it as a formula for the quantitative studies, you can put it like this, right? But if you want to think about it in more qualitative terms to really assess just more generally about vulnerability, it's also useful for doing less technical studies and understanding of problems. So this is the basis of the vulnerability assessment. It is a really, really important tool. It's being used in almost every project I know of that is doing climate change adaptation because climate change is providing these new impacts that were not anticipated before. And so with the onset of this new changes of potential hazards, vulnerability assessments are the quickest, um, most flexible, most comprehensive, um, and you can always do more to deepen your analysis. So I find this to be really useful for people who are interested in policy related to um, disaster management. So this is an image from Hurricane Haiyan, uh, which happened probably six, seven years ago, one of the most devastating hurricanes that came across the Pacific and uh, landed in Tacloban, really devastated these communities there. And what you see here is the initial impacts, right, of the disaster. But here you see children, how are they vulnerable, right? They're playing around electric, um, electric cables that could be very, very dangerous, standing on electricity. Um, so what population, the question becomes what populations are most vulnerable, not just with the event of the disaster itself, but you know, these are elements of sensitivity afterwards. What are the additive, what are the additional um, hazards, exposure that communities uh, have and how that affects specific people. So in a disaster, when we talk about vulnerable populations, we think about children, we think about pregnant women, especially when it relates to evacuation, the elderly, the, um, you know, those with disabilities, um, those are the kind of vulnerable populations that people see, tend to uh, try to prepare for first, 
um, because they need uh, additional support systems for life saving and otherwise. Here's another really unique example. This is from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. You have very, very populated um, what they call the favelas in urban areas, um, highly dense uh, buildings. And this is on a very steep slope. So what happened here, there's a landslide, right? Very destructive because there's homes here that you can see that were destroyed. There may have been loss of life in this condition. But when we think about, for example, exposure and sensitivity, we start to see here that what happened was it took out the only road that connected this area to this area. So you can imagine the additional uh, impacts of a disaster event, not just on the moment itself, but in terms of the connectivity, the access to markets, the mobility, and all these other issues when you're not able to pass, um, you know, impacts on people's time, um, dangerous conditions, um, all sorts of things. Here's an example from, and so I first talked about populations and that last slot was, um, was places, right? What areas for populations, areas, and the third aspect we'll look at is assets. So this is a case from uh, the Bangkok floods. Uh, this was about 10 years ago and the flooding not only inundated many places in Bangkok, but what happened, it, it inundated really, really important assets. So what you hear here, see here is a utility. This is an important electricity area. So the floods, if you don't protect areas like this, they can have really, really negative impacts where you can't get electricity to the communities around them that really need them. So one of the ways to build resilience or to reduce vulnerability is to learn about what are the key assets that keep a place functioning and make sure that you have interventions to protect them. Okay, those are general concepts. I'm hoping that what I'm sharing with you today uh, can serve as tools to help you to think about how disasters impact the place. Now I wanna shift out to a macro uh, perspective. I wanna look at basically development changes that are happening around the world. I wanna look at, can, can somebody mute Bowser? Oh, thank you. Um, okay, so on the one hand, what we see is a trend happening around the world, where as population increases, my pro I, I'm not talking about problems related to population, but what you're seeing here is that the world is urbanizing, right? So Indonesia in 1971 was 17% urban population. Today, more than half of Indonesia, 50 something percent of Indonesians live in cities. So that reflects the changes of development, right? Um, there's lots of rural, rural people, right? Half, you know, all of these rural populations, they're still experiencing about the same levels of vulnerability. But what's happening is you're seeing major, major impacts in urban areas, especially in secondary and tertiary cities. So in these cities, um, there's uh, the cities are not prepared for the types of populations um, that are developing in these areas. And this is a concern because it leaves people very vulnerable. So what you see is lots of migrants coming in or development or peri-urbanization, lots of places being built without the kind of public services that you anticipate, right? The access to water, the access to sanitation, the enforcement of zoning codes. So you see in places like Indonesia, lots of flooding happening all the time. You have very low water quality in cities that result in poor sanitation systems. It's a really bad public health situation in my view. Um, and also a lot of unfairness, right? Because those that have the capacity to pay are able to protect themselves, whereas the government functions aren't necessarily able to support the kinds of services of this demographic shift that's happening in a place like Indonesia. So that's a story that's happening around the world and very, very true for Indonesia um, in this slide. Over here, 
what you see here is the yellow bars at the bottom reflect the geophysical disasters, right? And these have really made, remained constant. The earthquakes, the volcanoes, they've been pretty much the same over the years from 1950 all the way to 2012. But what you're seeing is this blue graph, right? The earth, uh, the, the flood, the hydrometeorological disasters, the floodings, the droughts, um, the storms, the cyclones, the, the, the issues related to hydrometeorological functions, um, they've really been increasing. So you can see from 1950 to today, 2012, well, this is 10 years ago, but with climate change, what we're seeing is disasters happening as a result of hydrometeorological stressors. And this red here is really interesting, right? This line, this red line here is economic damages. So the more the disasters are happening over time because of climate change, because of hydrometeorological hazards, the more governments, households, communities are having to pay for it. And that really, really creates a burden for development, right? For the future of what um, you envision, right? For your future, for your children's future, for example, when you have to pay that much more for disasters and to deal with these hazards, it also means that um, you you can't uh, promise the level of, uh, of, of quality of life that you anticipate. Um, I'm sure you've seen this before. This is resilience. There's many definitions of it. The most simple way of thinking about it is that here's the hazard event. Something happens. A resilient uh, condition would mean that you're able to bounce back, right? They think of this as a ball situation. Bounce back and to become stronger and more resilient when an event happens. So this is the absorption of a shock. But those that are low resilience are vulnerable. They drop below this disaster threshold. This is when a disaster happens. And here you have conditions that you can recover quickly or conditions that disasters can really, really create long-term and devastating effects for a community. So how do we become more resilient? Um, here's some examples, right? This is the, a case from Boston where they began to identify and simulate and project the levels of sea level rise, especially when there's large storms from Hurricane Sandy, for example, how the sea level rise uh, creates exposure to communities. And they really were able to identify the vulnerable populations, the vulnerable areas, the vulnerable assets, and to introduce directed government funding to make those places more resilient, more protected in conditions that they hadn't anticipated before, right? Boston may have been built in this location because of um, historical factors, but with climate change, things are changing. So there's a lot of preparation short, in short of moving the entire city that needs to be done to protect communities. So that's kind of a municipal scale. Here we're looking at uh, uh, different examples of participatory development. Um, for example, in rural communities in Bangladesh here, what they started to do was map out a seasonal calendar for growing crops. And this was able to identify the different timing of when to plant certain things, when to harvest, how the weather is changing, how to better prepare for those things. And these can be done with very, very low tech um, approaches that can really be powerful and supportive of local communities. This is an example of Kota Tangrang Selatan um, that began to require any development, right? Any building code, Ijin uh, Mendirikan Bangunan, every time somebody applied for that, they were required to show that they weren't creating any extra runoff. And this is a remarkable example of how local governments were able to reduce floods very significantly um, through a very specific targeted program, right? Identify, the, do an assessment of the runoff when you're going to build something, make sure you have the catchment on site to make sure that it can address uh, different flood conditions and plan accordingly. And then the last um, kind of approach that I think 
combines all of these issues, uh, especially for a place like Indonesia that I think would be really important and really helpful in addressing many issues is to think about this kind of holistic concept of integrated urban water management. Right now, the way that you in Indonesia plan for things is you have the PDAM who provide the water. You have the PDPAL in certain places that do the sanitation. You have the Dinas Tata Air or the or different agencies that deal with, for example, flood conditions. So in those situations, what you can start to do is work together, right? You can identify where to access more water, where to target how to clean the water, where to create nature-based solutions to improve conditions, how to address waste in terms of composting, where to cite your reforestation initiatives, how to deal with groundwater issues, where to build. So this is a cartoon. I know it's very funny, but the whole idea here is to be holistic and integrated and not to think in silos, right? Indonesia, we always talk about ego sectoral. So how to break that, that ego sectoral to become more um, more able to conduct coordination between different sectors that allow to address using very simple technologies at time to become more resilient. So there's many different opportunities for engineering solutions at different scales. And I hope you think about ways for doing that. Um, a case study of Jakarta is a really good one. You know, there's really a lot of opportunities. Jakarta doesn't have a lot of water reserves. So on-site water collection and cleaning and also making sure that retention ponds reduce the flooding for downstream areas would have really, really big impacts on reducing hazards. And I think I'm going to just um, end here by saying, when we think about resilience, it needs to be a commitment at all levels, right? It's not just the national government. It's not the president. It's not just the governor or the Bupati or the Walikota or the Pachamat. It really it extends beyond governments, right? It's the individuals and the households. It's the community groups. It's the private sector. It's the coalitions. It's the young people, the youth, the university students like you who have an idea and you implement it and it grows and it affects other people how to do things. Um, and that can have really profound impacts on making a change, being a catalyst for resilience, for example. And two principles that are really important to think about is that, you know, doing things alone are much less effective than working together. So if you have an engineering solution to address a problem, like I mentioned, UEE's initiatives to do building codes, but how do you do the necessary collaboration, the participation of all the necessary stakeholders, the pumanku kapantingan, right? The people who have interests. How do you get them involved to implement solutions together that can have a really big impact on reshifting your communities to become more resilient? I'll stop there. Thank you very much for the time. And I really look forward to your questions and continued engagement with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation, Mr. Mika. Mika or Micha? Mika. Mika, okay, Mr. Mika Fisser. Uh, that's really interesting and comprehensive lecture. And now we will move to the discussion agenda. And please, if anyone here want to ask or maybe discuss something, you can uh, raise your hand or write your question in the chat box or maybe from our lecture ibu sri aminatun or bapak fendi mau membuat uh, mau berdiskusi sesuatu mungkin mengenai materi hari ini ibu sri ibu sri silakan ibu sri ibu fendi dulu aja saya ingin mahasiswa saya yang ini untuk mahasiswa yang internasional silahkan Oke, okay, mas. Iya. Yeah. Soal internasional moga. Please don't be hesitate to ask in bahasa ya, because surprisingly Mr. Micah can speak in bahasa friendly. Oke, 
Jadi kalau mau tanya bahasa Indonesia juga boleh. Nanti ditranslate sama Bapak Fendi. Silakan, mungkin ada pertanyaan dulu. Bapak silakan pakai bahasa Indonesia atau pakai bahasa Jawa, bisa ya, Mas Putu ya, Mas Nikah ya. Bahasa Indonesia aja. Bahasa Indonesia aja. Silakan, international class. Andi, Andi mana ini? Andi international class. Andi Hermawan. Andi. Silakan, Mas Andi. Kenia. Ini untuk materinya sudah di-share di chat box ya. Ya, saya share materinya, tapi um, uh, saya pikir ini di dalam ruang kelas, jadi jangan bukan untuk diposting di, di publik ya, artinya buat dipakai masing-masing uh, kalau ada konsep misalnya yang berguna, uh, tapi uh, kalau disebarluaskan ke publik mungkin perlu saya update sedikit sitasi-sitasinya um, uh, agar lengkap, itu uh, kaviat, <laughs> kaviat, apa kaviat. Itu catatan saja bagi yang mau menggunakan data dan informasi ini, karena saya um, pikir ini sebagai uh, presentasi di dalam ruang kelas. Gitu ya, oke. Okay, if not, maybe I want to ask questions first. May I ask you? Yes, please. Oh, oke, okay, thank you. Adik-adik yang di sini nanti habis habis saya langsung tanya ya. I hope uh, you also give a question for uh, Dr. Maika. Okay, so that's a very interesting topic for me and I think also for all the students here. Uh, the first one is, as we know that we have a uh, so many kind of disaster or maybe we can call it as a natural phenomena because sometimes uh, if if the disaster uh, disaster means that um, maybe it will be influenced with our daily life, it will be disturbed our daily life and something like that. So um, based on your opinions, how about the uh, disaster awareness in Indonesia? Because, you know, people in Indonesia sometimes um, didn't care about that. And how to, to make uh, the principle or the basic awareness for our society because I think it's very important because as we know that disaster is uh, everyone's business, right? Uh, disaster is everyone, uh, it, it including our daily life. So what do you think about that, Mr. Micah? Uh, hello. Can you hear my voice? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. The second question about a disaster is a is a business. What what do you mean by that? Can you clarify just a little bit? Okay, uh, I just want to ask you about your point of view about the uh, disaster awareness in Indonesia, because as we know that we have a large society and uh, because we have so many kind of disaster, but uh, you know that some people don't care about that. So how to make they can more aware about this kind of disaster, so we can uh, living in harmonic disaster. Okay, I think that's a really good question. I mean, <laughs> I think that Indonesians are very aware of their natural hazards. So I think that, um, you know, a lot of times uh, I get this question and people want to know how do people do it elsewhere? And, um, you know, disasters are local. And so, um, what you really need is people who understand places and cultures and situations. So it's, a lot of times it's not appropriate to take, for example, the highly engineered situations of like, you know, New Orleans or Rotterdam and bring them to a place like, you know, Samarang or something like that. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, there's been a lot of investment and a lot of studies and research and processes that you can learn from other places. But I, I do, the first thing that I want to say is that it's really important for um, 
to, to be aware of the strengths of a given location, right? You, you know so much about disasters. I mean, you could think about it the other way, right? Indonesians, how do you become more disaster aware? So Indonesia is the most disaster aware people in the world because they have so many different hazards. I mean, and, and I think BNBB, Indonesia, in ASEAN, for example, have really tried to frame it that way, right? Come to Indonesia to learn about disasters because we know so much about it, right? Um, and I think that type of knowledge is, is really important. Um, I think that, uh, to become more disaster aware, um, uh, was really a big part of my presentation. And I think it starts with, uh, seeing how systems are connected, right? Um, like this ego sectoral issue. Usually when you think about problems of water supply, right? I mean, it's it's very much connected to sanitasi or banjir, right? Even though that different agencies are dealing with them, so it's it. I think the to get people to be more disaster aware is to create the conditions, the processes where people can work together more effectively, right? So it's it's a process issue. It's creating the conditions for people to work together to better address issues of common concern, rather than saying, you know, somebody elsewhere knows something about how to do it better, so we should learn from them. Yes, it's always good to learn from other people, but I think Indonesia's challenges are really about systems and processes. Um, and I think that with small improvements to systems and processes, you know, the things that you, you don't even notice sometimes, right? Like the example I talked about from Kota Tangerang Selatan, where they had the zoning interventions to address flooding. Most people probably in Tangerang Selatan have never heard of that, but it required PEU to work with Perencana and to work with um, private sector building. It required an enforcement system where you know, people would check on whether those building codes were implemented, but over time, it reduced floods for millions of people, right? And most people don't know about it. So it's, it's, that's a really good example of how systems changes can have really profound, um, really big impacts. And I think um, the awareness of, of, of being able to work together to address an issue is a really, really important way to start building resilience. Yes, I, I agree that. with you. Yeah, <laughs> because talking about disaster, sometimes I think about the educations. Uh, like when I were in Japan, uh, studying from the kindergarten. So uh, learning about disaster is very important. And I think to make a disaster topic in a curriculum is also important. So that's why uh, I also totally agree with you that a small thing will accumulate. So small thing about uh, how to learn about disaster, how to understand about disaster. And after that, maybe we can learn more and more starting from the uh, kindergarten and after that starting uh, from the undergraduate. And so after that, we we can uh, act as, as, a, as a society in a, our community. So we become a community, a disaster community ready, maybe something like that. Thank you, Dr. Maika. Nice to hear yeah, from I'd like you. I'd like to comment on that. I, I mean, you know, if other people have questions, please, please mm -hmm. ask. But I, the, the parallels with Japan is really interesting. Um, right? I, I think what Japan is probably the best in the world when it comes to preparedness. <laughs> right? Preparedness, right? They do simulations, they do drills, they do all of those elements. But, you know, in a lot of ways, I think Japan could learn from Indonesia about how yeah. to do disasters, right? I mean, you look mm -hmm. at the Tohoku event, the earthquake and the tsunami mm -hmm. and then the redevelopment. Mm -hmm. I mean, because there was no, you know, there was very little kind of public input on redevelopment. A lot of communities were forcefully moved without yes. any consultation. Mm -hmm. um, which created new vulnerabilities for communities, right? Building a wall yeah. on the coastline to protect from tsunami and building mm -hmm. it so high that you can't see the ocean anymore is creating really big problems in other sorts of ways. So, you know, I just did an event with Indonesia and Japan on disaster management. And, you know, we were talking about the students that were gonna attend. Mm 
And the Japanese uh, professors were really worried that none of the Japanese students were going to ask classes. And the Indonesian professors were saying, oh, don't worry. Nanti pas, nanti pasti mahasiswa dari Indonesia pasti semua pengen nanya. Jadi jangan khawatir, pasti mereka mau berpartisipasi. So, you know what I mean? Um, those, mm -hmm. those aspects um, can really be elements of strength that I think mm -hmm we should not overlook in the Indonesian context, right? I, and there's so yeah. many examples of that, how, you know, local, you know, even just the idea of gotong royong, I mean, we don't do that mm -hmm. here in yes. America. We don't have that concept. And even though gotong royong <laughs> is complicated, right? Some communities mm -hmm. do it better than others. But, you know, in a lot of rural places in Indonesia, if you go to your neighbor and ask for something mm -hmm. and for help, they will do it immediately. You know, that culture of saling tolong menolong no, no. Isn't, isn't true everywhere. Um, that doesn't exactly. exist. And that, that mm -hmm. creates a lot of potential vulnerabilities, you know, especially on the social, you know, social exclusion and people, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of a lot of those uh, issues of being con connected to a community um, more prevalent uh, elsewhere. So I, I think it's mm -hmm. important to see the strengths alongside the uh, vulnerabilities. And, you know, I think Indonesia is changing a lot. And that's why for young people, this is such an important time, right? Being able to innovate, come up mm -hmm. with the engineering solutions and kind of come up with the ways of communicating that. Yes. And getting implemented in unique ways, that's really a powerful, powerful thing. Mm -hmm. I think Indonesia has a lot of strengths that maybe um, a lot of Indonesians are too kurang percaya diri, right? To realize, <laughs> untuk, menyad untuk menyadari bahwa ada kekuatan, ketangguhan yang, yang mungkin tidak terrealisasi, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. So I hope the student hears you have a strength, you have a capacity and ability because today you you learn a lot about disaster. Okay, silahkan yang mau tanya bahasa Indonesia juga in bahasa is okay. Silahkan. Mahasiswa yang dari international program? Uh, permisi, Mbak. Oh, yes. Mbak, siapa maksudnya? Uh, uh, permisi, uh, saya Samga Dimolana dari uh, kelas IP 2022. Oke. Okay. Do you want to ask in English or bahasa? Uh, bahasa aja. <laughs> yes. Oke. Okay, okay. uh, Mr. Meika, uh, Uh, saya sebagai orang Indonesia, uh, saya bisa melihat kebanyakan masyarakat Indonesia itu uh, jika terjadi bencana, mereka akan sangat cepat melakukan aksi tanggapnya. Mereka akan sangat peduli dengan sesama mereka. Akan tetapi uh, untuk dalam mitigasi bencana, mereka seakan-akan tutup, me tutup mata. Dan bagaimana tanggapan uh, Bapak Meka? Karena masyarakat Indonesia akan sadar dengan mitigasi itu ketika hanya sudah terjadi bencana. Jika tidak terjadi, mereka akan seakan-akan tutup mata begitu, Pak. Itu itu aja pertanyaan saya, Pak. Mbak. Oke. Okay. Itu perspektif yang sangat menarik ya. Artinya saya cukup uh, menyadari bahwa itu terjadi di di mana-mana ya. Memang kalau ada kejadian ya lebih cepat menanggapi dan memang uh, ingin membantu ya uh, jelas misalnya mahasiswa di setiap lampu merah kalau misalnya terjadi bencana pasti siap untuk gerak cari duit untuk mengirim ke lokasi dan sebagainya ya dan saya saya memang sepakat bahwa um, mitigasi itu memang sangat sulit uh, ya dan Uh, ada dua aspek di situ. Yang pertama, mungkin saja banyak sekali aksi-aksi mitigasi yang sedang dilakukan oleh masyarakat di mana-mana yang tidak kita sadari. ya. Jadi, uh, poin yang pertama adalah jangan mengabaikan bahwa uh, banyak aksi mitigasi di, memang dilakukan oleh masyarakat yang mungkin tidak kita sadari yang mencoba mengurangi uh, kemungkinan terjadi sebuah kejadian atau atau bencana. 
Um, tapi dengan perspektif itu bahwa uh, kita memang malas atau uh, tidak menyadari atau menurut saya itu berdasarkan pengalaman ya. Jadi dari satu sisi kalau sudah ada pengalaman sesuatu terjadi mungkin ada aksi-aksi untuk bekerja sama untuk menanganinya. Makanya saya tadi sebut bahwa yang kita butuhkan sesama saat ini adalah bagaimana menciptakan sebuah proses kerjasama yang uh, bisa mengatasi masalah-masalah seperti ego sektoral. Oh, itu bukan tanggung jawab saya. saya. Tadi saya tidak perlu lakukan. Oh, itu tidak masuk di anggaran kami, jadi tidak kami lakukan. Jadi bagaimana menciptakan sebuah proses kerjasama yang uh, dari, dari perspektif institusi menyadari dan melakukan aksi mitigasi. Um, dan saya lihat uh, deng, di banyak masyarakat di Indonesia, um, masyarakat memang malas melakukan mitigasi karena tidak ada tindak lanjutnya. Misalnya masalah-masalah sampah di daerah yang kita sebut kumuh gitu ya. Banyak sekali upaya-upaya untuk mengumpulkan sampah yang dilakukan, baik sampah macam-macam, pokoknya setiap berapa bulan ada program baru, tapi masalahnya kenapa tetap dibuang ke kali itu biasanya karena mereka udah ngumpulin ngumpulin sampah, tapi truk sampah dari pemerintah jarang datang, jadi itu menjadi kayak wabah baru uh, sumber penyakit karena sudah ngumpulin sampah, tapi cara yang paling gampang menjauhi uh, sumber penyakit dari sampah itu adalah buang ke kali misalnya, jadi Um, itu bukan bahwa masyarakat itu, apalagi ibu-ibu rumah tangga yang memang punya kepentingan utama untuk melindungi anak-anak mereka, ya, um, mereka akan melakukan apapun untuk menjauhi sumber penyakit kepada keluarganya. Um, jadi itu saling eh, bu, bukan hanya faktor malas saja, tapi uh, menurut saya faktor proses uh, bagaimana mengatasi masalah malas untuk memitigasi adalah Ya pertama harus saling bertanggung jawab ya harus punya proses untuk kerjasama harus bisa mempertanggungjawabkan anggaran dan uh, upaya program proyek ya proyek itu mem mem memiliki akuntabilitas yang sangat sangat rendah di Indonesia kalau udah nyebut proyek semua sudah merasa bahwa oh itu adalah cara untuk membuka keran duit saja kan. Jadi bagaimana agar proses-proses proyek itu tidak punya kesan yang buruk, yang tidak dipercayai oleh masyarakat secara luas. Dan kalau itu bisa terjadi, menurut saya aksi mitigasi akan mulai terlihat di mana-mana. Terima kasih, Pak. Yeah. Terima kasih uh, Mas Isam Gading and Michael Fisher for the answer. Maybe another question for the discussion dari kelas reguler mungkin. Pakai bahasa Indonesia juga bisa tadi. Ini ada sekitar 64 mahasiswa yang eh 60 mahasiswa ya mungkin yang bergabung. Mungkin ada pertanyaan lainnya. Kalau belum ada, maybe I want to ask a short question for Michael. Uh, I just wonder if we talk about disaster education at all level, actually how to actualize the concept in the real life. Um, apakah dengan memasukkan disaster science in our curriculum, curriculum is enough or maybe we have to act in another way. Maybe that's my question. I think it's a good question. I think a lot of people, banyak pihak sedang memikirkan uh, peran pendidikan uh, kebencanaan. Um, saya sudah lama bekerja dengan BNPB Pusdiklat ya, dan mereka selalu memikirkan, beberapa uh, tahun lalu mereka mau mendirikan Politeknik kebencanaan baru karena merasa bahwa sangat membutuhkan sebuah seperti ya katakan universitas yang bisa melatih dan mempersiapkan semua anggota calon apa calon 
um, pegawai negeri masa depan. Um, banyak juga yang punya seperti program kebencanaan di tingkat pasca sarjana atau di program sarjana. Um, dan tentunya banyak yang sudah memikirkan, melakukan simulasi, memperkenalkan konsep di dalam ruang kelas SD dan uh, di tingkat usia, pendidikan usia dini. Um, jadi uh, menurut saya ini ini pertanyaan yang uh, cukup menarik, yang belum uh, belum ada yang tahu bagaimana melangkah ke depan. Uh, karena kalau sudah mulai mendirikan sebuah proses yang baru, perlu standar, perlu sertifikasi, menjadi seperti uh, tambahan birokrasi yang cukup luar biasa, dan uh, menjadi pertanyaan apakah membutuhkan proses-proses seperti itu atau bisa dimasukkan di dalam uh, proses pembelajaran dan pendidikan yang lain. Um, kalau menurut saya, ya... Masih perlu banyak uji coba ya. Um, apakah itu program-program uh, seperti fakultas baru atau uh, sertifikat atau uh, ya bidangnya juga macam-macam karena yang terjadi adalah um, suatu program studi ingin melakukan program kebencanaan nanti pembelajaran kebencanaannya ya sama dengan uh, mata kuliah yang sudah ada di bidang itu jadi apa bedanya teknik sipil dan kebencanaan begitu ya uh, tapi menurut saya peluang besarnya dari pendidik sistem pendidikan kebencanaannya ada adalah uh, peluang untuk melakukan studi riset dan pembelajaran secara multidisiplin ya uh, seperti presentasi saya tadi adalah bagaimana misalnya kita menggabungkan pengetahuan yang luar biasa dari teknik dengan ilmu sosial misalnya dengan uh, planologi misalnya bagaimana menerapkan pembelajaran dari lintas sektor dan lintas disiplin agar bisa menciptakan solusi-solusi uh, solusi baru. Um, tapi ya, jawab, jawaban saya adalah semuanya perlu dicoba dan dilakukan ya di uh, di uh, pendidikan sistem pendidikan yang anak-anak uh, yang masih kecil sampai uh, program sarjana pasca sarjana menurut saya uh, perlu terobosan inovasi di bidang kebencanaan dan menurut saya UII sudah lama sekali melakukan itu dan um, saya sebenarnya ingin membalikkan pertanyaannya kepada rekan-rekan di sana. Sejauh mana kira-kira program studi ini sudah berkembang dan sistem pembelajaran kebencanaannya memang mencapai tujuan yang diharapkan dari awal. Baik, terima kasih atas uh, jawabannya. Memang menjadi PR juga ya bagi kami. Sebenarnya uh, kalau belajar mengenai ilmu bencana mungkin sudah masuk juga ke dalam kurikulum atau mungkin di beberapa sekolah dasar, mungkin ada beberapa juga yang sempat menyinggung mengenai uh, pendidikan kebencanaan. Tapi nanti mungkin beberapa juga semacam prosesnya kayak berhenti gitu ya, tidak berlanjut sampai ke lapangan atau ke masyarakatnya apa, dan penerapannya langsung ke masyarakat. Atau mungkin ada tambahan dari Bu Yunalia atau mungkin Bu Sri Aminatun? Ya, baik. Terima kasih. Saya ingin menambahi tadi untuk apa yang pertanyaan dari Gading, Nisam Gading. Gading masih online, Gading? Uh, Gading ya, Bu. Iya. Ya. Oke, okay, baik. Tadi Gading menyebutkan bahwa ada beberapa kasus oh, gitu di mana di mana untuk uh, mitigasi ini untuk bencana sebelum terjadi mereka tutup mata dan baru rame-rame setelah ada kejadian sebenarnya di Indonesia di negara kita BNPB itu sudah membuat program maksudnya di sana ada beberapa divisi di mana divisi itu diputi ada di, untuk mitigasi untuk rehab rekon untuk preparedness untuk uh, apa untuk strategis dan sebagainya nah di mana untuk kasus yang belum terjadi itu masuk dalam mitigasi. Jadi 
beberapa tempat yang memang dirasa itu beresiko risiko tinggi kebencanaannya. Jadi setelah dianalisis dan ternyata uh, di suatu tempat itu beresiko tinggi terhadap bencana, mereka sudah uh, bukan mereka BNPB sudah mengadakan penelitian, kemudian sudah membuat mitigasinya. Contoh contoh nyata yang uh, di beberapa tempat tsunami misalnya kita sudah menyiapkan beberapa tempat untuk evakuasi tsunami kemudian juga uh, apa selain evakuasi juga tentang uh, mitigasi yang lain seperti untuk penanaman uh, mangrove dan sebagainya kemudian juga untuk yang palu misalnya uh, yang kejadiannya sangat luar biasa kemarin untuk yang likuifasi likuifasi itu sudah dilakukan eh, apa namanya eh, pemetaan analisis resiko bencananya tahun 2012. Jadi jauh-jauh hari kita sudah melakukan pemetaan dan sudah disosialisasi ke masyarakat bahwa di tempat eh, yang bersangkutan berpotensi untuk privasi. Tetapi memang tidak mudah memindahkan masyarakat yang sudah berada di daerah sejak lama kemudian dipindahkan ke suatu tempat yang lain seperti itu tuh tidak tidak mudah sehingga eh, apa tetap menelan korban jiwa yang banyak seperti itu nah kemudian beberapa tempat yang lainnya juga seperti itu jadi setelah banyak banyak eh, nggak hanya tidak hanya tsunami tidak hanya privasi tetapi hampir semua tempat yang berisiko tinggi terhadap Bencana itu sudah dibuat mitigasi. Jadi pemerintah itu tidak tutup mata, tetapi kita sudah melakukan action, melakukan action dengan melakukan mitigasi yang ada di wilayah masing-masing. Setiap uh, daerah di Indonesia itu sudah ada, karena kita sudah punya inaris, inaris uh, BNPB namanya. Aplikasi itu sudah uh, tersebar di mana-mana. Di mana inaris itu di, di sana sudah menyebutkan hasadnya, hasadnya di suatu tempat itu apa saja hasadnya, kemudian eh, apa tingginya, tinggi resikonya, tinggi resikonya apakah mereka mempunyai resiko tinggi atau sedang atau rendah, kemudian kita apa kita membuat mitigasinya, kalau yang beresiko tinggi itu harus seperti apa, beresiko sedang seperti apa, berisiko rendah seperti apa, dan itu sudah menyeluruh di seluruh Indonesia. Ada, sudah ada semuanya. Di setiap tempat itu ada. Bahkan uh, tidak hanya di, maksudnya tidak ada yang, tidak hanya di daerah yang resikonya tinggi, tetapi semua tempat itu sudah ada, karena sudah di plot semua, di, di semua wilayah. Bisa dibuka di Inares BNPB. Jadi Inares BNPB di situ semua bencana yang ada di Indonesia ada di situ kemudian klik misalnya mau mengetahui daerah di mana tempat itu ada kemudian setelah itu dia uh, apa ada mitigasinya juga mitigasi struktural maupun struktural yang ada di sana ada di sana. Ya. Ya, seperti itu saya Mbak, Mas Gading ya ya Bu ya Bu ada yang mau lagi Mas Uh, mungkin maksud saya bukan ke petugas-petugasnya sih Bu, tapi ke masyarakat luasnya Bu. Mereka enggak akan mungkin kebanyakan dari mereka enggak peduli dengan mitigasi itu mungkin untuk pihak yang kayak di tempatnya Ibu mungkin peduli gitu Bu, ya. Yeah. Oh, maksudnya masyarakatnya. Iya, yeah, masyarakatnya. Oh, Ibu. Ya, karena masyarakatnya ada beberapa daerah memang yang mungkin belum tersentuh untuk peningkatan kapasitas, tetapi kalau mungkin yang generasi muda sudah sudah hampir semua ya sudah di mana mana ada FPRB Forum Pengulangan Resiko Bencana, di mana di sana anggotanya itu kebanyakan memang anak-anak muda, tetapi juga semua pihak terlibat di sana. Setiap tempat ada Forum Pengulangan Resiko Bencana. Jadi saya kira. Okay, yeah. Ada lagi, Mas Gading? Makasih aja sih, pertanyaannya bagus sekali. Terima kasih, Bu. Ya, ya Bu. Ya. Ya, baik, silakan untuk uh, yang lain. Silakan majukan pertanyaan. Seperti kemarin saya bilang, satu mahasiswa, satu pertanyaan untuk Dr. Maika Fisher. Silakan.
sambil Enggak, nunggu kan? sambil nunggu adik-adik mungkin saya tadi nanggepin sedikit ya yang terkait dengan apa pengetahuan kebencanaan di Indonesia tadi ya yang uh, Pak Maika tadi terkait dengan apa hanya sekedar kurikulum itu cukup gitu ya sebenarnya kebencanaan kan uh, apa itu jadi urusan kita bersama gitu ya jadi yang paling utama adalah ya kita harus sadar itu dulu ya bahwa kita uh, we live in Indonesia uh, Indonesia itu kayak dalam tanda kutip laboratorium bencana bisa dikatakan begitu kenapa saya bilang laboratorium ya karena dari situ kan kita bisa bisa belajar gitu ya kita bisa belajar di situ ya mungkin uh, bencana di Indonesia uh, akan berbeda dengan bencana di negara-negara lain seperti itu. Kemudian terkait dengan uh, how we uh, gimana ya, bagaimana kita menyusun ya kurikulum yang uh, memang di dalamnya itu ada konten-konten uh, atau wawasan kebencanaan itu memang di UI sendiri sudah cukup lama itu menjadi wacana kami begitu. Cuma uh, memang karena seiring pengetahuan berkembang gitu ya, kemudian bahkan sekarang kita uh, mulai memasukkan apa namanya fenomena alam yang lebih kompleks ya. Uh, ini menjadi salah satu mata kuliah yang nanti dimasukkan ke basic science di mana bencananya itu lebih mendalam lagi gitu ya. Sehingga uh, uh, menjadi salah satu upaya bagi kita untuk ya capacity yang meningkatkan kapasitas gitu ya sehingga kalau kapasitinya naik gitu ya vulnerability-nya nanti berkurang sehingga risknya juga diharapkan akan turun seperti itu kita bisa meminimize risiko dari bencana. Cuma yang uh, seharusnya kita lakukan juga tadi seperti yang saya katakan ya uh, sebaiknya dari level yang paling bawah pun sudah sudah ada uh, pengetahuan atau sudah ada uh, di share pengetahuan tentang bencana itu sendiri kayak kalau saya kemarin uh, learn from uh, Japan gitu ya mereka dari kecil itu sudah uh, aware ya dan bahkan di sana bukan sekedar pengetahuan tapi juga ada uh, kind of simulation jadi ada simulasi uh, about disaster ya taking for example fire gitu ya terjadi kebakaran kemudian terjadi gempa itu ada simulasinya sehingga mereka juga langsung action uh, ketika tidak hanya sekedar teori dan tahu kemudian ketika ada bencana mereka langsung action uh, misalkan langsung uh, apa namanya menutup uh, apa namanya melindungi kepala kemudian uh, ke bawah meja dan lain sebagainya dan itu juga berawal dari uh, usia dini begitu sehingga itu sudah menjadi kebiasaan ya jadi tidak kaget lagi kalau terjadi bencana uh, untuk yang level-level universitas begitu ya itu juga tetap masih ada simulasi-simulasi seperti itu bahkan itu dilakukan rutin nah, harapan kami ke depannya kita juga seperti itu bahkan sekarang juga sudah mulai ya kemarin ada simulasi kebakaran kemudian nanti harapannya juga ada simulasi tentang uh, namanya yang lain ya. Cuma ini 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 juga menjadi uh, PR ya bagi kita bukan hanya sekedar kami tapi kami juga butuh kerjasama dari semuanya dan adik-adik di sini juga ya. Kemarin kita adakan bridging juga terkait dengan disaster. Um, kami berharap itu juga uh, bagian dari bekal untuk adik-adik semua biar uh, paham tentang uh, disaster ya. Kemudian kalau kita sudah tahu tentang disaster, uh, automatically ya secara otomatis kita tahu akar masalahnya, otomatis kita juga akan bisa ketika terjadi bencana, apa yang harus kita lakukan kita bisa lebih paham begitu. Dan itu salah satu sebagai upaya mitigasi bencana sebenarnya. Karena uh, belajar itu juga upaya untuk uh, bagaimana kita meminimal uh, meminimalkan risiko yang terjadi akibat bencana itu tadi. Mungkin itu, tapi tetap ini masih menjadi PR kita ya, bagaimana bentuk yang paling uh, bagus atau paling efektif yang kita tanamkan bagi uh, kita ya, baik kita sendiri maupun pada adik-adik dan teman semuanya, biar kita lebih aware sehingga ketika terjadi bencana itu kita langsung punya solusi terbaik gitu ya dalam menghadapi bencananya. Mungkin itu tambahannya, saya kembalikan ke Mbak Anissa sebagai moderator. Yang lain silahkan kalau mau bertanya, kita masih ada waktu sampai jam maksimal jam 11 ya Mbak Anissa. Halo, yang lain? Gak ada. Belum isi, izin bertanya. Oke, silakan. Uh, di daerah Bukit Bintang itu kan uh, belum lama ini terjadi tanah longsor. Untuk penanggulangannya terutama di daerah yang di mana mobil, motor itu berlalu lalang itu bagaimana ya? Masih. Halo. Ya, halo. Jelas, Masalah jelas di, suaranya. Ya, di Bukit Bintang ya. Iya. Oke. Okay. Ya. <tuh> Bukit Bintang itu uh, sudah pernah saya kajian untuk longsor dan 
memang yang apa ini yang baru-baru longsor ini dulu yang saya kaji itu memang posisinya sedang. Bu Yuna mungkin tahu yang di Bukit Bintang Bu di daerah Sri Mulyo. Kita pernah membuat oh, iya. Iya. Ya, 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 di sana. Mitigasinya di daerah Siti Mulyo itu beberapa Sri Mulyo beberapa warganya sudah dipindah. Mas Faras relokasi. Di relokasi. Okay. Ya, di relokasi tetapi memang alangkah sulitnya merelokasi mereka yang sudah bertahun-tahun rumah di situ bahkan dia lahir di situ tanah tumpah darahnya di situ itu tuh tidak mudah saya udah berulang-ulang sudah saya apa namanya sosialisasikan berulang bahwa di daerah ini resikonya di zona merah di zona kuning itu sudah berulang-ulang tapi di sana nggak mau pindah pertama memang tanah tumpah darahnya kedua memang di sana tuh strategis banyak sekarang pengusaha-pengusaha yang incer tanah mereka. Jadi mereka semakin kekeh untuk apa memegang teguh tanah mereka. Sulit. Usaha mitigasi sudah dilakukan. Jadi kalau dari segi apa, karena tadi yang ditanyakan adalah yang mengenai uh, transportasi, jalan. Sebenarnya kita sudah membangun talot, sudah membangun dinding penahan tanah yang handal di sana. Tetapi apapun itu karena mendesakan masa yang tinggi, masa tanah yang tinggi, dan musim hujan yang memang curah hujannya kemarin itu cukup tinggi juga, sehingga dinding penahan tanah itu pun nggak bisa menahan, jadi jebol. Itulah artinya kalau memang hanya dari segi mitigasi e, beton, itu sulit. Satu-satunya memang... Meng, menghindari daerah itu kalau jalan memang kalau bisa kita membuat jalan di lokasi baru yang memang tidak berisiko sama sekali kalau memang itu rumah atau pemukiman atau hunian dia harus e, pindah dari situ atau relokasi jadi kalau dinding penahan tanah untuk longsor kalau setahun dua tahun iya tetapi kalau untuk selamanya nggak bakalan mampu karena kekuatan beton sendiri akan berkurang dan masa tanahnya tanahnya itu akan semakin gembur istilahnya jadi semakin mudah longsor kekuatannya semakin tinggi jadi sudah dilakukan mitigasi tetapi karena memang DPT-nya itu ya dinding penahan tanahnya itu sudah bertahun-tahun, bukan bertahun-tahun tapi memang lima tahunan ya seperti itu longsor terjadi dan mengenai badan jalan itu ya Mas Faras jadi mitigasi itu ada dua macam ya jadi ya. dari ini konstruksinya sendiri begitu ya hmm. nah, itu sebenarnya sudah diperhitungkan ya karena kan kita ini ya level curah hujan di wilayah tersebut begitu cuma itu tadi kalau semakin lama ya tanah jenuh air begitu ya sehingga betul yang dikatakan Bu Sri tadi masanya semakin bertambah kemudian dari tahun ke tahun juga walaupun kita sudah mendesain uh, dinding menahan tanah atau retaining wall itu dengan sedemikian rupa uh, hmm. ada kalanya nanti ini apa sudutnya itu akan lama-lama karena masa tanah yang cukup padat dan cukup berat tadi dia akan menggeser nah, lama-lama dia akan uh, apa namanya ya me, me, dalam tanda kutip merusak uh, dinding menahan tanah itu jadi memang selain itu juga sebaiknya memang dilakukan ini ya pengecekan ya terhadap uh, kekuatan dinding penahan tanah jika dia sudah mencapai masa layan yang melebihi masa layannya seperti itu. Kemudian yang kedua terkait dengan transportasi transportasi tadi, saya rasa juga uh, BPD sana juga sudah bertindak ya bagaimana untuk me mengatasi itu. Tapi memang karena kemarin itu curah hujan cukup tinggi sehingga ya yang terjadi memang terus akhirnya kalau tidak salah arus lalu lintas terjadi ini ya, agak terganggu begitu ya. Jadi Uh, lumayanlah yang uh, apa namanya jadi disaster di sana. Kemudian relokasi tadi betul kata Bu Sri ya. Jadi ini juga PR bagi kita semua ya pendekatannya itu bukan lagi pendekatan uh, education uh, approachment tapi lebih kepada gimana ya uh, caranya biar dari hati ke hati gitu ya. Mungkin Bu Sri udah pengalaman di lapangan ya, ya susahnya seperti apa begitu ya. Walaupun kita sudah sediakan kita iming-imingi begitu ya Bu Sri ya. Udah diiming-imingi hal yang ayo nanti dibuatkan 
tempat di tempat lain ya tapi karena yang pertama dia sudah lahir di sana pengennya ya nanti sampai akhir hayatnya di sana ya yang kedua mungkin mereka merasa akan nanti mata pencariannya hilang kalau mereka sudah direlokasi tempat yang baru walaupun sebenarnya kita juga menyiapkan solusi-solusi yang lain seperti itu ya begitulah kondisi masyarakat tadi yang sudah saya singgung uh, ada kalanya memang kita harus memberikan edukasi ya uh, dan kedua adalah ya dari hati ke hati tadi untuk Uh, mungkin ngasih sesuatu yang me membuat masyarakat itu bisa oke okay lah saya mau uh, merel uh, merelokasikan diri begitu ya karena memang itu tidak mudah ternyata pelaksanaan di lapangan seperti itu mungkin itu tambahannya baik terima kasih okay. uh, berarti kesimpulannya uh, relokasi eh, apa namanya uh, pen pencegahannya sudah dilakukan yaitu berupa relokasi tapi itu sulit dilakukan dikarenakan masyarakatnya itu tadi ya? Ya, buka uh, kesadaran masyarakatnya iya. Maksudnya uh, karena rata-rata masyarakat di daerah pegunungan di apa namanya di pinggir pegunungan itu di lereng itu yang sudah berusia tua memang pendidikannya rendah, jadi sulit banget untuk menyadarkan menyadarkan memberitahu sudah tetapi juga memberitahu masyarakat di sana itu tidak semudah memberitahu masyarakat yang memang pendidikannya tinggi. Jadi ya kita harus memahami kondisi masyarakat yang ada di katakanlah di lereng-lereng pegunungan kayak begitu di lereng-lerengnya. Kondisinya untuk pendidikan tidak seperti pendidikan yang mungkin ada di kota atau di daerah lain yang memang eh, apa jangkauan jangkauan ininya lebih mudah kayak kayak gitu. Tapi sudah dilakukan. Yang pasti relokasi sudah jalan di sana memang tidak tidak banyak. Yang di sana mungkin ada 5000 sekian masyarakat yang berada di daerah merah, di zona merah, itu hanya baru beberapa, enggak ada 100 yang ada di sana yang relokasi itu. Kalau yang di Sri Mulyo itu hanya 30-an, enggak enggak banyak. Jadi masih banyak sekali yang ada di zona merah yang memang belum belum apa belum bersedia direlokasi kita memang bertahap dan rata-rata masyarakat itu yang mau direlokasi itu mereka sudah terkena padahal program kita relokasi itu program mitigasi program sebelum kejadian bencana itu terjadi tetapi rata-rata masyarakatnya setelah bencana terjadi baru bu saya mau loh direlokasi nah, program mitigasinya udah habis begitu gitu mas Baras Baik, Bu. Terima kasih. Ya. Mau nggak ada lagi? Silakan, apakah ada pertanyaan lagi? Mungkin untuk pertanyaannya masih ada satu dua kali pertanyaan lagi, ya, Bu ya, Bu Yunalia. Atau satu pertanyaan terakhir? Ya, mungkin satu pertanyaan terakhir. Silahkan. Oh, ya. Siapa yang jadi penutup? Dede, siapa ini yang mau tanya? Kita buka satu penanya terakhir. Nggak ada. Kayaknya udah nggak ada. Kalau nggak ada, ditutup aja. Ada. Oh, ini ada Alif, nih. Ya. Alif. Silahkan, Mas Alif. Gak jadi ya. Iya, gak sih. Halo. Ini dari IP, mana ini suaranya dari IP ini? Oke, kalau nggak ada mungkin udah cukup Mbak Anissa. Ya, baik, Bu. E, terima kasih atas presentasi dan diskusinya kepada Mr. Michael Fisher dan kepada partisipasi eh partisipan juga pada para dosen atas e, pertanyaannya, diskusinya dan juga waktunya untuk bergabung ke dalam kelas hari ini. Kemudian mungkin ada closing speech dulu dari Bu Sri Aminatun untuk penutupnya. Oke, untuk penutup saya kah ya? Ya, boleh Bu. Ya, Mbak Anissa sekalian. <laughs> Oke. Oke. Eh uh, Okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, Mr. Mike Fisher and thank you very much for uh, my student, my all student class and regular class. Uh, 
in the morning we have discussion about disaster disaster uh, science disaster mitigation vulnerable capacity and uh, hazard and may I, uh, this uh, disaster science basic hope to uh, your continued study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mika and all um, college and student. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, terima kasih. Mas, kapan ke Indonesia, Mas? Mas Mika? Desember. Desember? Oke. Okay. Desember. Kemarin nggak hadir di Bali, ya? Iya. Yeah. Waktu itu, di BDRR? Anda hadir. Prof. Carl Kim hadir sama teman-teman dari University of Hawaii di sini.